Well, here we are. It is March 27, 2024, and this is another video. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, Sotheby's results from uh, Asia Week in New York uh, uh, over the last week or two. It was they had some they had some very good results, as as one would expect. And of course, they have the Hong Kong sales coming up, which is really their big spring event. Um, they do they do a very good job in New York, of course, but they they have I think four or five auctions scheduled right now for Hong Kong, uh, and we're going to do a, a, a preview of those in a few days uh, maybe maybe tomorrow I just but I wanted to get the uh, results done um, for the New York sales first all right now a couple of things I did want to mention um, about these uh, the Hong Kong auctions that we're going to talk about is that there's some extremely uh, rare examples in here um, one of the sales is called the dragon um, Emperor of uh, Chinese art because it's the year of the dragon so they're doing a sale in honor of that and then they have some pieces from the Li Shantang collection, uh, treasures of art uh, from Sai Yiming, uh, some really great uh, porcelains, paintings, and, and all this good stuff. And we're going to go through that. And then, of course, the uh, uh, ritual and reality. This is a, a heavy, heavy on bronzes and um, uh, early, early pieces, archaistic works, and so forth. Some great examples in here, as you as you might expect. And then the last thing is sort of a, uh, an interesting sale because it's the uh, a collection, a, a very important collection that was acquired from the legendary dealer, connoisseur, collector, Edward Chow, um, who uh, was very famous and uh, he, he, he was sort of went out of the business around 1980, but his collection ended up being sold at Sotheby's um, to great acclaim. They published a three volume book set on it. And he was one of the real, uh, he was the top guy, I guess, in Hong Kong at that time, as far as dealers uh, and collectors and connoisseurs go and uh, it's going to be sort of an interesting sale I think for Nicholas Chow because Edward Chow was his grandfather and Nicholas Chow as many of you know is the head of the Asian art department at Sotheby's he's done an enormous really uh, great job in building that department up and uh, you've seen him interviewed and so forth and he learned he, his introduction to Chinese art was at the knee of his grandfather Edward Chow and I, I, I just can't imagine a, a, a greater introduction to Asian art than having Edward Chow as your granddad. And there are pieces in here that, that, that Nicholas remembers that disappeared to this English collection, and they're now coming back. And we're going to go through them all, some unbelievably rare things. But first, we're going to, this, in this video, we're going, to just, we're going to get now get down to the results from New York. One of the things I wanted to mention was um, Wrathful Deities. This was uh, one of the auctions that was supposed to take place at Sotheby's, and it was suddenly canceled canceled for some reason and the two bronzes were withdrawn and uh, there's been some speculation about it um, uh, somebody uh, told me that they they think what happened was was that these were coming out of a foundation a buddhist foundation and they think that what may have happened a benefactor may have stepped up and said look I'll, 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 you're short of money i'll buy the bronzes then i'll loan them back some sort of arrangement was made i think so that the foundation could keep them and get the money they needed for whatever reason uh, they had for needing it it's the organization is a little mysterious there's not a lot known about it except that they talk about they educate the, the western world and other parts of the world about buddhism and so forth and i don't think there's anything nefarious i just think they're very private and there's nothing wrong with being very private so at um, any rate, I hope they made a good deal, and I, and I, I trust Sotheby's probably worked out something where everybody came away uh, a winner, which is, of course, the best deal of all. All right, now over to the... Uh, to this Chinese. Oh, last thing. Uh, there's been some news and, and a couple of you have commented on it. And I've been meaning to mention it before I forget it. Um, in May, Sotheby's is cutting their commission rate. This is a big story, actually. Sotheby's is cutting their commission rate uh, rates across the board. Um, uh, we published something that got out over on Patreon. If one of the Patreon users, we posted the article there. But basically what it looks like is that they are uh, getting rid of seller commissions altogether on the top end lots that they sell things over five or 10 million. It sounds like they're not going to take any commission from them and that there will be a buyer's premium, of course, on the back end of uh, 20% and then some, a sliding, uh, maybe a sliding scale for the buyer's premium um, after that when it reaches certain levels. It'll be interesting to see how it all uh, uh, shakes out, but it's it's big, it's been an issue for the last few years that this the buyer's premiums have gotten ridiculous and everybody knows it and they're untenable and they're just 30 percent buyer's premiums are ridiculous and it's just a shell game um somebody has to pay for the auctions and uh, somebody has to you know in, in, in no matter and no matter how they do it the, the seller ultimately ends up paying the commission 
uh, because because it all gets calculated into the final bidding price and the buyer's premium. And the sellers the buyers know what they're doing, and in the end, the seller pays all of the commissions. All of the commissions come out of the seller in the end uh, because it's all built into the bidding process. So. And those of you that have been to many auctions know what I'm talking about. So at any rate, that's that's that story. We'll talk more about it in the future. Uh, but for now, we're going to talk about the Chinese art, uh, art sale that took place on March 19th, a few days ago. They had very good results, I think, across the board. I think Sotheby should be really happy. I think Christie should be very happy. Uh, because this was sort of a litmus test, these last auctions. How strong is the market? There's been so much going on in the world. So many crazy things, wars and... Uh, 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 and, and, and of course, China's being accused of doing everything but kidnapping Judge, kidnapping Judge Crater. But uh, I, I think it's, it's starting to calm down. And I hope this hysteria uh, subsides. At any rate, here we are. Uh, the uh, moon flask, this one. We talked about it in the preview. I thought it was lovely, lovely moon flask. Love the, uh, the, 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 uh, the way the lotus blossoms are painted and the cluster uh, in the center of the peaches, the longevity peaches and, the, and the, good, the good luck bat flying over it and all that. And uh, apparently the crowd liked it too. It was estimated two to 300,000. I thought the estimate was very reasonable. And in the end it was. It, was th it ended up selling for um, 368,000. All right, and remember when you hear these estimates and hear the, the prices realized, um, I, I, the, the video we did on estimates and how often they're inaccurate. And this, I think you're going to see some prime examples of it in here. Um, they, they're really just ways of telegraphing to the audience where the reserves are at this point. All right, this, and then there was this, the Chan Chu Ping with the dragon and underglazed red uh, dragon and the underglazed blue clouds. Uh, this was a wonderful porcelain, beautifully decorated, nicely proportioned, good crisp. The red came out so well. The blue came out very, very well. All the shading, the artistry, how it was painted, the, the, the sense of motion of the clouds, everything was done so well on this. And uh, in the end, the crowd loved it. Ended up selling for uh, 660000 U.S., um, about uh, 160,000 over the high estimate. The estimate was three to five hundred thousand, but not a surprise. And we talked about it in the video, you know, because in the past they've all these have all brought sort of in the in the in the six hundred, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollar range. And again, here you have it. It did the same, but it was a beautiful piece, and uh, of course it. Uh, it had a hole in the bottom. Even with the hole in the bottom, it brought 660000 I want to remind everybody of that. So it shows you how far um, these pieces have come because they have to accept the fact that pieces may have been drilled at some point. And thank God they were because they were turned into table lamps, and table lamps tend to survive a very long time, often more, more longer than uh, do vases that are washed and used and, and uh, put out over and over and over. Those tend to get broken and chipped. But table lamps sit on tables. They sit there for decades. So... Thank goodness. All right, and then on to this, the Robin's Egg May Ping vase. Very, very pretty vase, unmarked, uh, but I, I liked it. I thought it was uh, extremely attractive. Uh, there's some old stickers on the bottom, uh, a property of Mr. Hayes, some sort of mu museum uh, number on there. Uh, and so forth. But the color of it was really, really good. And, and the way the, the blue uh, drips down the, the deposit, so you get these nice changes in color, light and dark blue, the, real, the true robin's egg uh, glaze, extremely smooth, very nicely done. And so I was surprised it wasn't marked. I was, uh, it didn't have a, a mark on it, but it didn't. And it was estimated at 80 to 120,000, which is a very strong estimate for an unmarked vase. I have to say, uh, but I thought it was so beautiful. Why not give it a shot? And somebody did, and it ended up selling for just over the low estimate at eighty-two thousand and uh, uh, five hundred and fifty dollars. It was a good buy. It was a good buy. It's a beautiful object, and uh, uh, it got there. All right, and then over to this, the Jai Jing Mark and Period uh, box with the gold dragons and the blue enamels on the top. This is a wonderful piece of porcelain and a, and a rare type. They don't turn up very often. Uh, if you go back through the auction catalogs, you won't find many of these ever having had, you know, have turned up over the last 20 years. They did make them, of course, and there's, there's several of them in the Palace Museum. There's a picture of the bottom of it, and you can see that heavy orange peel that was starting to come along um, during the 19th century and sometimes appearing on the bottoms of things. But the uh, a, a decoration, the, the appearance of the dragon, all of it was just beautiful, and uh, the crowd loved it. And it was estimated at two to three hundred thousand dollars. Ended up selling for four hundred and forty-four thousand dollars. Again, well over its estimate. Solidly sold. Uh, nice thing. Very, very nice thing. 
And then the dish. This was that Yongshen dish. Yongshen dish that we, I, I, I wanted to, I was very curious to see how this would do because it's, you know, it was, it was very much done in an early Ming palette with the, with the, with the, with the blue background and the white flowers, which is, it takes an enormous amount of skill. And it was something that was devised during the Ming dynasty by outlining um, areas of white so that would leave them as flowers and then applying the cobalt to the rest of it to, to present the contrast. And uh, it, was, it was a revolutionary trick at the time. And it apparently came back during the Yongchen period for a little bit. And uh, they, they did this dish with it. it is marked on the back, of course. And uh, the, the estimate, I, when we talked about it a few weeks ago, I thought the estimate was very, very low for what this is because it's such an interesting and unusual example that you don't see very often. And sometimes unusual examples you don't see very often can fall through the cracks. In this case, it didn't. Uh, a, a lot of people liked it a great deal. It ended up selling for um, um, almost four times its high estimate. It ended up selling for $25,400. But beautiful thing, unusual thing, and, and the right thing for somebody who likes rare birds, unusual objects that you don't see often. All right, and then there's this. This is that great little uh, Celadon Yon Dynasty um, uh, box with the flower on top. This is a small box, only a couple of inches in diameter, but exceptional quality, really, really beautiful quality. Um, and this was, I think this was sold, wasn't this sold by um, Marchance? Yeah, it was sold by Marchance in um, um, uh, uh, 2018 in their catalog. But a, a great thing, very, very nice. There's a good view of it. The color was good. The relief work was very, very good on it. Top quality. And uh, in the end, it did very well. It ended up selling for 20320 just as a hair over its high estimate, but uh, uh, well worth it. That's a great little box. Really is. Great quality. Good color. And then over to this. This was a box I liked a great deal. And it was very unusual, very atypical. Uh, probably why I liked it so much. But it was beautifully done. It's a late Ming example. And uh, here's a picture of the bottom of it with the lid side by beside it. And you don't see these very often. It, it almost had like a like a textile cover, like you would see on some Central Asian or, or, or um, Far Eastern textiles, um, the way this was done. I thought it was just great. And uh, it was estimated modestly eight to 12,000, and it barely sold, it barely got through. It went for $5,000, but I think somebody got a great object for not a lot of money. That's, that's my view of it. If other people don't want to pick up on it, uh, but if, if, if you're curious about these kinds of boxes, go look them up and find one that has any sort of uh, cover that looks like this. You're gonna be looking for about a week uh, because they don't turn up. And that may have discouraged bidders. As I've said many, many times, and I'll continue to say, um, uh, some buyers are only interested in buying sort of recognized name brands, um, instantly recognizable with lots of comps, lot, and that gives them the confidence to, to bid. And uh, uh, I don't view those... I don't view those as great, I, great, a great buying method. I, I think that you should buy what hits you hard, and that's the thing you should buy. Just buy it, no matter what. And uh, it takes courage to do that because you're not following the herd, but you can build an awfully interesting collection. That's the old. That's how they did it in the old days. That's how the guys bought back on between 1900 and 1930. They bought what struck them. All right, and then there's this: the cafe ground um, reticulated bowl with the cobalt interior. Uh, this was a really neat bowl, very unusual. Um, and it had the entrance hole in the bottom to put water in it to keep warm. Wan Li period, beautifully glazed. Again, another Marchant uh, uh, item. I thought this was just a great, interesting thing and very, very unusual. And uh, it ended up selling for $3,556, sort of right, right about center of its estimate of three to 5,000. But an interesting object, something you're not gonna get sick of. Um, and uh, again, something you're not going to see very often. And uh, that, that's the thing I found most interesting between this and the, and the previous lot, the box. All right, and then over to this, the Chinlung engravings. Uh, you may have been wondering, we talked about these. These were the engravings that Chinlung had the uh, Jesuits do the, do the drawings of. And then he had the paintings sent to France. And the King of France sent them to his steel engraver at the, uh, at the Academy. And they reproduced them in steel and made sets of these uh, copper plate engravings and then sent them back to China. There were only 100 sets made. They made an extra 100 sets just in case the ship sank. They sent them on two separate ships just in case and uh, they all made it there 
and uh, except was retained by the king of France and um, uh, uh, one of the governors or something, and I think that was about it. But very rare set of prints. That is the point of it. It was estimated at twenty to thirty thousand, which I thought was absolutely reasonable, and I thought it was sort of a bargain. And uh, it went over it. It ended up selling for forty thousand six hundred and forty. But what a, this is a, a great bit of history because the story is so interesting. And it showed the relationship that was 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 good between the the Jesuits and the and the and Emperor Qianlong and the, and the court going back and forth. And this was, of course, before the the, the French and the British decided they wanted to addict the whole country. But uh, before they did all that, they got along pretty well. It's a shame they blew it. Uh, but at any rate, these were the engravings. Absolutely great. I hope whoever got them um, um, finds a nice spot to hang them in their house or something. Beautiful things. And then this, this now these, these are a couple of lots that I, I, I pulled out that were in the sale. I didn't talk about it in the preview, but I wanted to go back to them because they caught my eyes being very, very, again, atypical, unusual. And they were given very low estimates. This, this was a beautiful Kung Shi bowl estimated with a, with a Xi Jing mark on it, I believe, right? Yeah, the Xi Jing mark. And this was estimated at uh, like $1,500 or something, some very low estimate. No idea why they estimated it so low. Underglazed blue, underglazed red. Um, very unusual combinations with the with the fruit and so forth. Beautifully painted, absolutely beautiful. I think these are, are these persimmons. I don't think they're peaches. I think they're probably persimmons. But a very very rare a mix of colors um, on a bowl like this. Unusual pattern. Um, the whole bit. This has this bowl had everything going for it. I thought this was absolutely fascinating, and I thought the estimate was was silly low, and it ended up I think for selling for an absolute bargain, even though it went over the estimate. The estimate was fifteen hundred to two thousand U.S. Sold for thirty eight hundred and ten dollars. But what a rare thing! What a very rare thing this is. Uh, very unusual. Again, atypical things that are great and interesting can fall through the cracks, and I think this is another case. This was a very, very unusual bowl and beautifully potted. Notice the potting on it, uh, the, the way the, the wall curves in slightly, this nice rim lip they put on it, very delicately placed, and then the body slopes under and then curls under and a nice strong base under it. P beautifully potted, wonderfully potted piece of porcelain. And I think for $3,800, that was an absolute bargain. Great thing for $3,800, as was this. This was another Kangxi period bowl with a very unusual drawing style on it with white underglazed red, white enamels, and um, single stroke blue, um, uh, uh, underglazed blue decoration. There's no outlining it. These are all just strokes, stroked onto the piece, and then the flowers and, 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 and buds added and so forth. Uh, this was an absolutely great looking bowl. It almost looks like it has like a grayish white slip on it too. I'd have to exam I'd love to see this in person. But the pottering on it was very, very good. Uh, all the way around. This is a great looking bowl. And there's the bottom of it with just the flower. And there's the interior of it with just another flower. Very simple. Um, almost looks like it's, it's like a Zizhou type of drawing uh, on the interior uh, if it were black and white. And, uh, and down the back, um, there's a lot more decoration. And, uh, and there it is. I thought this was a wonderful bowl. And this only sold for $2,159. It measured eight and a half inches in diameter. It was Kung Shi. And this is one of these cases where you, you can get a great thing at Christie's for, I mean, Sotheby's and the Christie's. You can always find, if you're patient and you sit there and wait, you can find some great things um, for a bargain basement price. And these last two bowls, I think, were absolutely fabulous purchases. Uh, you know, as far as uh, interesting, rare, and uh, very well done, but uh, but not following the herd, so to speak. That's that's the smart way to buy. The other thing I noticed in the sale too is there's sort of a trend here on these types of porcelains. This porcelain, these are these sort of quickly sketched Kung Shi wares. This one, that one, that one. All right, all three of these were in the sale. They were fairly clustered together, and for some reason, every all of these did very very well. Um, uh, against their estimates. This was a, a, a wonderful piece of Kung Shi where it was originally sold to the previous owner by the dealer, John Burwald, who's a, a London dealer, very, been around for years and years and years, good dealer. And uh, this was estimated at four to $6,000, sold for $38,100. 
And uh, this was the, the style of decoration. Um, uh, so, sometimes these are attributed to Shunzhu period. Um, and there's been a, a little bit of debate about these. You'll find some of these in the famous Butler book, I believe. But beautiful looking, beautiful looking uh, piece, wonderfully potted, about seven inches, I think in height, I think was the height on it. Um, he's not terribly big. Uh, six and three quarter inches, just a hair under seven inches, ended up selling for 38,000. And then you had this, another one, sort of a pear shaped vase um, with, uh, I don't think this has, yeah, no mark on the bottom. This was also from Marchant. And um, this with the horses on it, love the horses. Everybody knows I like horses on porcelain. I love that. That was great. Beautifully done. But again, that quick pencil sketch, not the heavy brush, not the heavy cobalt, very light touch, very delicately painted. Again, people had a lot of interest in this and it was estimated at seven to 9,000, sold for 21,950. And then the last one was this plate, um, um, a Kangxi period plate. Again, um, it remind, it's very reminiscent of some of the Japanese plates you see done in blue and white from the Meiji period. Uh, but this one with the, these quickly drawn mountains, quick sketches outlined, a little bit of shading in, but a lot left to the imagination, as, as they say. And uh, But wonderfully potted, pure white porcelain and so forth. And I think this was also sold by Bachant. I think this all maybe came out of a sale they did or something, catalog. But a, a very, very fine plate all the way around. And uh, everybody seemed to like this one also. Estimated at 1500 to 2000 sold for 7000 for this plate. And the plate was, I think, eight inches in diameter or something. Six, oh no, smaller, six and a quarter inches. So it's basically a saucer. So that was that was sort of an interesting little trend for that. I, it was just that style of porcelain. You see, you see them because they're attractive. And it, it just seemed to me that, is there a sudden interest in this for some reason? Or is a book that's been published? If you know anything about that, let me know. I'm curious. Curious why those are suddenly getting so much steam. All right, and then on to this. This was something I had meant to mention in the preview, and I didn't, and I, I was kicking myself for not doing it. Is this really, really nice three-star god um, uh, cup. And uh, there's a famous one in the Bernat collection that was a Boston family that had an amazing uh, Qing Dynasty porcelain collection um, that was sold off years ago. But... Um, um, here you have one of the the star gods handing a the Shao Lu handing a uh, a peach to the little boy resting on the shoulder, and uh, just a charming scene, beautifully done Yongshen period, uh, but very very I think I'm pretty sure it's Yongshen. I'm just yeah oh Qinlong Yongshen to Qinlong period. They don't not sure. Um, looks Qinlong, it looks Yongshen to me, but who knows? Uh, and there's an inscription on it. Uh, beautifully done. Uh, there's one, I think, in the Taiwan Museum just like it. Just a, a very rare type of cup. Absolutely beautiful. Um, is that sold by Marchant too? Or yeah, This was also from a Marchant sale. They dated it as Yongshen. Um, and I, I tend to agree with them on that. But at any rate, uh, there's, there's the front of the cup. Beautiful. And uh, it did very well at the end too. Sold for thirty-one thousand dollars against a fifteen to twenty thousand dollar estimate. Unmarked Yongshen um, three-star god cup, but very unusual color palette, very unusual design, and perfectly done. So again, uh, a little bit atypical, and it got a lot of attention there. So um, um, that's that's about it for all this, for the sales. They, the sale did great. The, the jades did well. Um, there was a lot of, it seems like there's a little bit of a, a interest coming around these days on um, a, a good Sung Sai uh, tangware and, and some tang um, uh, um, uh, white wares and so forth. I noticed some, some fairly good results because they've sort of been in the doldrums for a while, it seems. And suddenly there seems to be some interest in it. So we'll see. Maybe maybe Tang is coming back. After all, they, you know, they've, 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 they've done a lot with Sung. They've done a lot with Yuan, obviously. Lots of Ming stuff, Qing stuff. But Tang pottery and porcelain has sort of been on the outs for about 25 years now. And it may be that uh, people are having to uh, regenerate some interest in it because it's, it's, it's great stuff and it's been overlooked now for... If you're a collector, it's been overlooked probably for the entire time you've been collecting. People don't talk much about tangwares anymore. And most of that is because of the copying problem and the, and the shenanigans that went on with tangwares back in, uh, years ago when they were really, really doing a number on collectors by selling them fakes. And I, I think maybe maybe science is starting to catch up. And if, if, if scientific analysis can uh, uh, clear away those, those potential problems of fakery, uh, maybe the, the market will come back for it. All right, that's about it. 
Have a great week, and uh, we'll be back with more videos in a day or two. There's a sale on the French furniture that we're going to be doing that was pointed out to me by a, a very nice lady at Christie's um, um, a, a week or two ago, and I'm going to be doing that. And then, of course, the Hong Kong sales are coming up. We'll be doing the results on those. That's it. Have a great week. Subscribe if you haven't so far, and uh, we'll see you in a day or two. All right. Bye-bye.